this is sort of titled Why Austerity is Not Rational, but it's actually a lot more than that. And we're going to sort of end up at, at that with what is going on around the world. And uh, well, thank, you. thank you, Mimi, and the Socialist Party for the opportunity for me to give my views on the state of the capitalist economy today. Uh, and this is going to be sort of in three parts. First, I'm going to start with a brief explanation of my view of how capitalism works at its core and sketch out the material needs of the system reflected in this formula, MCM <coughs> prime. And I brought this like this so that people don't get money, because usually when they hear things like this, you know, hey, like this, it's like, God, what's going on? So that you start to take some of this mystery out of all of this, because uh, unfortunately, Marx did a lot of this, and therefore we're stuck with it. Um, <laughs> you don't need it. You can understand the system without it. But uh, unfortunately, when you're dealing with particularly academic Marxists, uh, you got to you got to understand it. Um, and I'm going to leave out and leave aside the subjective desires of the individual capitalist and just concentrate on the, empir the material imperative that I, I, I see it as having a physical imperative imperative for growth and most people really don't. Right. And just as important as how it works internally is an appreciation that it does not work abstractly in a vacuum, but is fundamentally interdependent on the material world, that is, on the biosphere, and most importantly, on the finite nature of many important resources on planet Earth. Without with, in my view, capitalism will eventually collapse. And also what I will, will argue is that capitalism has objective requirements and therefore the subjective desires of those at the top cannot keep the system functioning for long when those physical necessities dry up. I suggest the world capitalist system is now approaching those material constraints. My argument is that capitalism cannot work for long without growth. Most environmentalists, and in my view, most Marxists, believe that capitalism only has a tendency to grow. That those at the top control and guide the system as if it were an empty vessel, divorced from the real world. And as a consequence, most environmentalists, and sadly most Marxists, or at least many Marxists, conclude logically, if you understand that, but wrongly that the system can be regulated into sustainability. Right, did everyone understand what I said there? Was that clear? Okay, because you know, if you get behind on some of these things, then it starts to get really confusing. Right, and then secondly, I'll sketch a brief history of what unfolded economically since the Second World War until now. And lastly, I'll end with my take on the current worldwide policy of austerity and why it is not rational for the capitalist system as a whole, even though there are obvious temporary monetary gains made by multinational corporations and individual capitalists. Also, since I'm presenting a full plate tonight, you can tell, uh, in a short period of time, I will re read a good portion of my talk so that I can finish all three sections that I just mentioned and leave sufficient time for discussion. And anybody that comes up with, like, what the hell is that about, you know, make a little note if you can and bring it up. I will stop at times when I bring up certain uh, concepts that I think people may have a little trouble with and we'll, we'll go over it. Okay, let's start with Marx's characterization of the entire capitalist system's production cycle with his formula, MCM. This is the formula that sets capitalism apart from all previous systems of production. 
How many of you are familiar with MCM Prime? Please. Okay, well, good. Uh, it describes a capitalist method of production and exchange. As opposed to CMC, this one, I picked green because, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's not capitalism. Uh, uh, it, uh, the CMC form, the formula describes most all previous types of production and exchange systems. You know, feudalism, slavery, um, even um, early, early class societies that hadn't really completely gelled. Um, does everyone understand that, what that represents? Well, before capitalism, and both slave and feudal systems, independent producers, artisans, peasants, etc., would produce something useful, which is what the C stands for, a commodity, product. Marx chose commodity. And then the, the item, the product, the commodity, was exchanged for money. And that's the M part of the formula. And then the second C represents the item that was exchanged for money that has now ended up in new hands. And that process, that is complete, it's finished, it's done. It doesn't have to go anyplace else. You can go home and maybe never do it again in those societies. Um, now this formula, the capitalist formula, MC1M prime, has turned the closed cycle, the one below, on its head. The small scale production of use values is what this is. Now becomes a large scale production, mostly speculative, of exchange values. First M represents money capital, the initial investment in what, what Marx called constant capital. The buildings, machinery, raw materials, etc., and also included what he called variable capital, the money to purchase labor time, the labor time of the workers needed for production. And that's all in that first M. The C stands for the actual process of production of the commodities and where a surplus first appears as surplus commodities. And that's the stuff that the capitalists get for free. Um, the surplus commodities contain within themselves the potential surplus, surplus value, and that's what ends up being profit in money. The MC M1 formula sets capitalism apart from all other economic systems. Now, I've put this up here, and unfortunately, this is what Marx kind of uses and has become the basic formula, and he actually says so in Capitalism. In volume two, like on the first page, he uses this. But he goes, brings up this formula, which is more precise, and if this had to become the one, then maybe what I'm doing tonight wouldn't have been necessary. Because money capital, this begins with money capital, this is the process of production where the commodity is produced. And this represents the surplus value. So now the capitalist has the amount of stuff that the workers that he's paid for and the machinery, everything's been paid for. And he has extra stuff. But the capitalist doesn't want extra stuff. He wants more money here. So he has to sell the stuff. So this gets confusing for a lot of people. And they think the process is over here when the capitalist owns the surplus value, which is the extra stuff. So unfortunately, in all three volumes, of capital, Marx never completely explained this side of the formula. 
either here or here. That is, where does the extra money come from in order to sell the stuff for more money than was originally invested? But he did occasionally ask himself, in capital, both volume two and three, not so much in one, uh, the right questions. And I don't have time to mention them all here, but here are a few quotes. And here's the first one, and this is, you're gonna have to really pay attention because Marx, you know, he starts to, number one, it was 150 years ago. So, um, he, it's in Capital, Volume 2, Chapter 5, where he highlights this side, which he doesn't talk about often, he just kind of assumes that this happens. He uses the word assume all through, particularly the first volume, and assumes that this <laughs> takes place. Um, a formula. So he emphasizes that side of the formula, the sales side, with there is a difference between C, M, and M, C, which has nothing to do with the difference in forms of commodities and money, but arises from the capitalist character of production. Intrinsically, both C, M, and M, C are mere conversions of given values. So you ain't got to pay attention. You know. This is how he writes. Uh, one of the reasons why reading capital can be very difficult, particularly if you don't do it in a group where people have done a study. Uh, they are mere conversions of given values from one form into another. But CM is at the same time a realization of the surplus value contained in C prime. MC, however, is not. Hence, selling is more important than buying. Under normal conditions, MC is an act necessary for the self-expansion of the value expressed in M if everybody's following this, but it is not a realization of the surplus value. It is the introduction to its production, not an afterward. Uh, so it's obvious he <coughs> sees selling is more important than buying, but he doesn't say where that extra money comes from. And Marx zeroed in on the real realization of profit, because that's where the profit comes from. But unfortunately, don't explain where the extra money came from. In the aggregate, you know, the whole total capital, um, in order for the system to continue to accumulate and reproduce itself on an expanded scale, you understand that, to, to keep growing. And he didn't revisit the issue significantly in volume two until chapter 17, the circulation surplus value, subsection one, simple reproduction, where he said, quote, an opponent of Tuke, who was a, an economist of his time then, who clings to the formula MC M1 prime, ask him how the capitalist manages always to withdraw more money from circulation than he throws into it. Mind you. He goes with an exclamation, mind you. The question at issue here is not the formation of surplus value. This, the only secret, is a matter of course from the capitalist standpoint. The sum of values employed would not be capital if it did not enrich itself by means of surplus value. It is taken for granted. The question then is not where the surplus value comes from, but whence the money comes into which it is turned. Now, there's a bunch of other times. He goes into maybe it's gold producers, and he never answers the question in all three volumes. Are you going to answer it? 
Uh, <laughs> yes, that's what this is about. And because this is a minority view that I'm expressing here, um, the first person to really undercover this was Rosa Luxemburg, and she got trashed about it to this day. And my view, she was right. So um, let me continue. I will. I'll get there. But how, how it actually works. Um, um, is any other questions about what I would just said? Something that like didn't make sense or, or, or your heads are swimming. <laughs> All right. I do have uh, a quick question. <coughs> okay, good. Uh, C prime, um, the surplus, right? At that point, it's, is it a surplus in a, like in a monetary value? Or is it surplus no, in the form of a commodity? It's the commodity. commodities. And this is the confusion. If Marx had a, said this is the basic formula, we wouldn't be doing this. It, it, Rosa Luxemburg would have been listened to. There was a whole bunch of things. Okay. This is assumed in Capital Volume 1. Right. And that's what most people read. They don't get any further. Right. And Volume 1 is an abstract situation that he sets up. And he says so. And he assumes a whole bunch of things. He, he, he sets up a world of capitalists and workers, nothing else a very pure, abstract thing in order to analyze and deconstruct the system. Of course, this real system is also in a, bi a biosphere, and it needs real things, and, and, and there are all kinds of other folks around that are not workers. And so how it, that's what Rosa Luxemburg ends up doing, is kind of finishing capital. And remember, uh, uh, kept the first volume of Capital was published when Marx was still alive, and that was the abstract one. Volume two and three were only notes, and some of the notes on some of the chapters were very skimpy. Engels put them together over about a 15-year period and got them published. So it's incomplete at that level. But even so, in his notes, he never answered what I'm asking about. Where the hell does this extra money come from? Because, well, I'm going get, to be getting to it more as we go. So, Marx throughout capitalism, when he describes the beginning of the process, that the capitalist throws money into circulation to start production, then at the end of the process, withdraws more money from circulation than was initially advanced. He asked himself where the extra money came from and is never able to provide an answer. There is no magic pool of money that just floats around in circulation. The capitalist and the banksters dispense it into circulation initially and with interest. Large numbers of the world's people are now born into mature capitalist economies where growth is almost a constant albeit sometimes hardly visible. The money in circulation is vast. In the advanced industrial countries, most of the middle class and even some privileged layers of the working class have accumulated some extra money, savings, above and beyond subsistence, which also helps mask the source, the need of new money. When overproduction rears its head, the above savings help to conceal the severity of the downturn. But until sufficient growth is achieved, through new money being advanced, loaned into existence, with interest, like what we are experiencing now, the above savings will be eventually wiped out, stagnation or contraction will become the new normal. In the real world, the scale of production is enormous, and even a meager expansion, more means of production and more workers, obscures the fundamental disequilibrium. New investments, advances, and credit pump extra liquidity into cir circulation and stay ahead of the central imbalance, just like a Ponzi scheme. But even so, periodically, the disequilibrium surfaces through a crisis of overproduction, which is precisely what led to the present crisis we're in now. 
Put aside all of the exotic and outright fraudulent financial schemes developed by Wall Street and the banksters. At bottom, far too many houses were built on credit that could not be paid back. Before I move on to part two of this talk, let me give a made-up example of how capitalist production and monetary systems fun functions. Imagine that tomorrow a couple of hundred people dig themselves out of an underground facility after a nuclear war and find they are the only survivors on the planet. One of the survivors has a million dollars in cash and owns a large machine and woodworking shop and a retail general store that miraculously are the only structures that survived the blast. He, she gets together hires a dozen cops out of the hundred and, see, and security people and announces to the others that life will continue like before and she he will organize and provide jobs for everyone. Food can be grown in the parking lot next to the factory where others will produce the necessities and a few niceties of life. In the workshops, others will scavenge the region for the necessary raw materials. Let's assume the production cycle and pay cycle is two weeks. Let's also assume that the individual workers receive as a wage one half of the value in money of the products they produce. Because this is what happens. This is what this is. This is the, the extra commodities that they produce that they're not paid for. That's the profit. Because if you pay them everything they produce, there's no profit. So you, it won't work. It won't be capitalism. So on payday, they go to the general store and buy back one half of the goods produced in the preceding two weeks. And therefore return the money paid out in salaries back to the capitalist who has now broken even on his her initial investment. The capitalist now has a bunch of stuff that he, she can't possibly use. What's the point? In other words, if you produced uh, 10 million Frisbees, and you sell back five million, what the fuck does a capitalist want with five million frisbees? <laughs> he wants more money. So where does that money come from? And a lot of people say, oh, it comes from other workers and other, well, of course it does. But that's the point. In the aggregate, if there are 100 factories, they're all faced with the same thing. So what, what needs to happen, and this is what Rosa Luxemburg goes into very thoroughly, Actually, Marx does too, originally, when he deals with primitive accumulation of how they, they do it. But then he never applies it to this, to explain this, because he never got there, number one. Got to remember, Engels was really pissed off at it. Because the last 10 years of his life, he didn't finish two and three. He just diddled with it a little now and then and added here and there. And he spent a lot of time on... Um, British agriculture and also the Russian peasantry and the, the chances for the, for the Russian, the whole system in Russia to be exploited. And um, so, anyway. This is the conundrum faced by the capitalist system. Where do you find the consumers for the surplus product? The fact that capitalism emerged in through Europe with plenty of consumers beyond the capitalist's own workers masked this fundamental contradiction. Little by little, the non-market folks, serfs, peasants, and artisans were forced into the money market economy so that you kept introducing new money and new variable capital, meaning you're hiring more workers, exploiting more resources, you're expanding. And in order to get this, you have to keep expanding, and that's part of this overall total capital expansion that I'm talking about. Now, in my make-believe situation, the ex-capitalists could have hired the ex-cops and set up some kind of command economy. <coughs> Slave, feudal, or a mixture of both. Production would be planned for use with enough <laughs> of the subsistence of workers and lots of goodies for the boss and her, his henchmen. Excessive or speculative production would be senseless under that kind of an arrangement um, because there wouldn't be money involved. It would be more like feudalism or slavery. You just kind of divvy it up, even if it's uneven. 
Um, or it could have been, they could get together and democratically decide to divvy, divvy it up equally and have some form of socialism. Okay, one more quote from Marx will help back up my contention that the capitalist system requires growth. At least Marx thought, though, even though he didn't answer this, he keeps referring to, and here's, here's the quote, the reproduction of a mass of labor power which must incessantly reincorporate itself with capital for that capital's self-expansion, which cannot get free from capital, and whose enslavement to capital is only concealed by the variety of individual capitalists to whom it sells itself. This reproduction of labor power forms, in fact, an essential of the reproduction of capital itself. And then here's the key line. Accumulation, and it was um, emphasized in, in capital too, Accumulation of capital is therefore increase of the proletariat. Capital, volume one, chapter 25. So that's the part that he has assumed that the population will always expand in order to have a new pool of workers because you have to keep expanding and employing more workers in order for this to work. Um, I hope I know. Jane, you have a hand back here. Yeah, go, yeah, Sarah. Like, okay, so like, what about, uh, like, it, it, like um, as more machinery becomes I'll sophisticated? Be oh. I'm going to get there. Okay. Good. You've got a note on that. I think the above statement makes it clear that Marx recognized that expansion was a given. And ipso facto must necessarily include resources and markets and the human population. Go. Just um, before we go much further, could, just for a little bit of a, like a historical perspective, you had mentioned that uh, Luxembourg had been trashed for her view. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit the why and by who? Why don't? Bakari. Well, that's the one who officially did it on paper, but there were two hacks that did it within months of the publication of her book in 1913 uh, from the German Social Democratic Labor Party. Um, one from the, the daily paper and one from the weekly, I think. And they both just sliced it and diced it. Primarily because she was out of the left wing. And the war was a year off and there were big divisions and the like. And you know, the, all these hacks in the rest of the party were supporting their own bourgeoisie in the war a year later. And she ended up in, in jail a year and a half later. So she was thoroughly trashed. Bukharin did it later, six years after she was dead. And it's still used as the, the piece to say, ah, she didn't know what she was doing. And I'll, I'll get into that in, in, the, uh, in the end. Um, actually, all of that could take a whole freaking session. I'm writing a book on that. It'll take me another two years. <laughs> um, uh, skip over this because I was going to say that, that this all didn't originate with me, but I, when I finally read Rosa Luxemburg's Humanist Cabinet about 15 years ago, ideas that I'd already been developing crystallized and um, they were kind of disjointed before and, and I think I've actually even extended her analysis a little. And I don't have time tonight to do justice, but we'll, we'll go into it a little more. But there will, I would like to quote one short passage from Rosa Luxemburg. Quote, and since the earth is finite and the acquisition of new markets must sometime come to an end, the time will come when the question can no longer be simply adjourned. Sooner or later, a definite solution will have to be found. Because she, pointed out how, where this comes from, this constant expansion. And that, because her subtitle was, uh, you know, a contribution to the origins of imperialism on her book, Accumulation of Capitalism, or why they had to go across the entire planet looking for markets 
and consumers and workers to keep this thing going. All right. So, and I think it was incredibly prescient that she brings up that that process can't keep going on on a finite planet. Well, like a hundred years, before, this was a hundred years ago, long before many other Marxists even dreamed about it, forget saying anything about it. So, uh, way ahead of her time. So, before moving on to the second part, I'd like to say a couple more words about growth. That's like, how often do we all hear on the media, the mainstream, and the alternative, that the economy needs growth? You know, the concept is ubiquitous in the culture. It just permeates the culture. But most folks, left and right, political or not, believe the way out of this economic mess will be found through growth. So I will leave this question so at the end, does the capitalist system have objective internal laws or is it an empty vessel that can be manipulated by the ruling class and or pressure from the working class? And if you noticed, I never, didn't even bring up competition in all of this because, in my opinion, it has little to do with this imperative for growth. What it does have to do with it, it exacerbates the problem, that the chasing around and adding new machinery, which we'll be getting to soon. Okay, uh, part two. A quick, let's look at the big picture over the last 40 years in order to place today's crisis in some kind of context. Uh, I'm going to sketch out what, kind of briefly, very truncated, what happened since uh, the end of the post-war boom. The physical destruction of industry during World War II in Europe and Japan allowed U.S. capitalism, imperialism, to rapidly expand and dominate the political economies of the West for over two decades. Then in the mid-60s, European and Japanese capitalism was sufficiently rebuilt with factories and machines with a higher organic composition of capital. They came online with a vengeance. U.S. capitalists lost their monopoly, contributing to the decade of the 1970s of stagnation. Okay, I'm going to stop here and ask, what does a higher organic composition of capital mean? Does anyone want to take a stab at it? Or notes? No, but I'm, I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, because you've got to do it fairly quickly. Well, yeah. How about you, Gabe? Well, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the sort of classical definition of, of uh, the organic composition of capital, which I don't entirely understand, but it empirically seems fairly obvious that the, the physical plant of, of German and, uh, and Japanese industry had been completely destroyed because of the war. Right. So that, that in comparison to American physical plants, they were newer. They were, they were rebuilt, rebuilt, they, they were newer. They were rebuilt newer. They had more sophisticated machinery. Thank you. Uh, more modernized machinery. So, uh, so once they got online, they were in a uh, much better position because they were newer and because they had, uh, you know, they weren't worn out. Or not only were they not worn out, but the machinery itself was technologically more modern and so in a better position uh, to compete a part of what it meant to be more modern, I guess this gets to uh, the organic composition of capital, part of what it meant to be more modern is that it was more automated. Uh, and, and so they, they had less use for, uh, for uh, uh, workers. They had fewer workers able to produce more goods. Exactly. Uh, the the productivity of labor increases yeah. once the sophistication of the machines rises. But, but there's also a very controversial aspect of all that, that the rising organic composition of capital leads to a tendency for the rate of profit to fall, and there's, there's very yeah, abstract I don't know how that about. goes into the yeah. rate of profit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
All right. In terms of crisis theory. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's one of the people get into that discussion. But if you look at the rate of profit falling, let's leave it that. Prices fall. I mean, I, I can tell you in my lifetime, there's sophisticated stuff that costs a hundred times more than it does now. Because now it's cranked out in very sophisticated machines with people pay, being paid 40 cents an hour. So um, that, if that's not even arguable that the prices haven't fallen. Now, whether or not the rate of profit falls because of this, that's a separate issue. And I don't want to get into it tonight because now you're really getting going yeah, yeah. into a, which really doesn't have a lot to do with the basic argument I'm making about the organic composition of capital, meaning that it displaces workers. And that's the point that across the world um, we have, there, there's, getting close to two billion people that are pretty much redundant that the capitalist system does not need. All right. Anyway, that's what it, what, what, um, it means. It means uh, that the more sophisticated machinery raises the productivity of labor. Those are intimately tied. And you hear these things separately a lot of times about the productivity of labor. Well, there's a reason why. There's another side of it. You can raise, raise the, the productivity of labor by you know, getting an overseer with a whip and make them work harder and faster, and you'll get a little more productivity, too, up to a point. And Marx goes into the two types, and I don't want to get into it now because, again, it doesn't really have anything to do with this imperative to expand, this need for growth which is what uh, uh, tonight's talk, in my opinion, is mostly about so that it help, will help us to understand my contention that austerity isn't good for the capitalist system. Yes? Um, would you say that both of the issues that you just put to one side, the issue of the Rate, rate of profit, right. and the issue of the productivity of labor, while important issues and Very important. connected to today, yes. the distinction between them and what you're looking at is that, that they are contextual. They are dependent on particular times and conditions, yeah. and you're getting to the actual nature of capitalism oh. and how it operates how it in operates. any time and place. All, so at that all people times. understand <laughs> that the other ones are dependent on what? On this baseline, and the Thank action you. of the baseline first. Thank you. Okay. Uh, concurrently, during the 50s and 60s, the third world went through a rapid decolonization and many of the nationalist regimes, the non-aligned countries, erected trade barriers against the industrial powers, and in some cases they provided large subsidies on basic necessities for the poor and emerging working classes. Now, this was uh, possible because of the existence of the Soviet bloc in China and the Cold War, which allowed much of the third world, a couple of decades of limited sovereignty. Then, financialization, the centerpiece of neoliberalism, uh, was initiated in the United States under the Carter administration in the late 70s and shifted into high gear under Reagan in the early 80s. U.S. competitors in Europe and Japan were not far behind in their shift to neoliberalism. And, and, uh, the increasing power and influence of multinational firms drove the neoliberal era. Japan peaked. This is something people should, I don't know how much you paid attention to what, what's gone on in Japan. Japan peaked in its over-leveraged building boom in the late 80s, actually 1989, and crashed and hasn't fully recovered yet. And that's 25 years ago. And this leads into why, uh, as we're going to get a little further into this, you know, uh, I kind of in a minority position on, on a number of things. But it was the Japanese elites that first introduced quantitative, e quantitative easing. Anybody know what that is? Because you hear hear it. 
Well, I'm going to go on and we'll be explaining it so that you don't get... free money? Thank you. But it's free money it's both, to, both, to, right? to banksters. No interest. Just take it. But it's free money to the banksters. Yeah. Not to anybody else. Not to us. I know. That I can guarantee you. So, uh, yeah. easing and managed to keep the large insolvent Japanese banks, and they were insolvent, from going under. They even tried negative interest rates back in the 90s, the 1990s, like what the EU banks are toying with now. But neither strategy fully revived the economy, and Japan has been in 25 years of relative stagnation. Europe fared a lot better, particularly Germany, and was able to engineer the EU, the European Union, and the Euro, the Europe, the common currency, uh, and the common market with the common currency. However, what enabled the anemic growth, as opposed to no growth, over most of the last 30 years of the neoliberal period was massive debt, both public and private. When U.S. When U.S. capitalist class, the U.S. capitalist class, fully recognized the new competition from the Japanese and Europeans, that was when they developed what is called the Washington Consensus or neoliberalism. They could have decided on rebuilding the manufacturing infrastructure in the U.S. to compete with the newer factories in Europe and Japan, but decided instead to outsource to the third world and attack workers at home. The attack on organized labor in the U.S. resulted in flat wages and an escalating loss of health and retirement benefits. The stagnant wages were com compensated for by a massive increase in easy credit, particularly aimed at the working class. Now, that was the first time this has ever really happened in history. When integration of computers into the manufacturing and distribution systems became widespread, the repercussions of the increase of labor productivity on a world scale put greater and greater pressure on the elites, I should say financial elites, to find creative ways to continue accumulation. One bubble after another formed and was used to attract investment in otherwise diminishing investment opportunities. Now, that's what I'm saying. There are shrinking opportunities for the capitalist class in the world scale because things are, well, we're facing the limits to growth on the planet. At the same time, financialization led to an over accumulation of capital. Now that means there's more and more both asset capital and money capital in the hands of tiny elite at the top. That's what over accumulation means. Both, and it was in both fixed and money, meaning that overcapacity in factories and machines began to press down on profits across most of the developed world by the mid to late 1990s. After the dot-com boom and bust at the turn of the century, evidence of deflation started to appear. Alan Greenspan, head of the Federal Reserve at the time, lowered interest rates and helped kickstart the now well-documented housing boom, bubble, and bust leading to the crash of 2008. Now my incredibly truncated narrative up to this point only touched on some of what I consider the most important events in the last 65 years, I guess. But I think it will help to put in context and lay the groundwork for the period we are in now. So, Part three is 2005, six socialist-minded folks <coughs> took five months to develop a seven-week, three hours per session class called Converging Storms, the crisis of energy, capitalism, and the environment. We gave the first class in the spring of 2006, then again in 2008, 9, 10. And after a three-year hiatus, hiatus, we gave it again last year and are giving it again this summer. I hope all of you can attend. 
The reason I'm mentioning the class is because the understanding reached during the intensive five-month planning sessions back in 2005, um, both by myself and a few of the others, led me to write in the summer of 2006 that the next downturn would be deep, systemic, structural, and last a long time, and maybe never recover to business as usual. So far, those projections are pretty much on the mark. During the last few years before the crash in 2008, I was called a catastrophist, you know, essentially a kook with these ideas. What's the no, I mean, after like repeal of Glass-Steagall, how could it have been sort of seen as like, cat, you being a catastrophist, right? Like, I don't see how this, you know, the advent, like credit the false swaps, et cetera, how that was really that unexpected or that, that this couldn't potentially happen. Well, it's, it's not in a rear view mirror, but at the time, I would bring this stuff up. My brother and I, and Lisa too. Yeah, Lisa. Uh, I was just going to say, I have a moment frozen in my memory. It was the uh, social, the LA Social Forum at USC in June of 2008, in which uh, leaders of the ISO were saying to me, well, you and, and Gene is such a catastrophist, it's not going to happen, blah, blah, blah. And the crash happened in August of that summer. The assumption was, and still is amongst so many, is that it's business cycles, number one. It's not, it's not fundamental down here in the roots. So that, yeah, you see these signals, but you read them as temporary. And, and that um, it's, it, they're, they're only looking at certain variables rather than the space that Gene is laying out for you. Okay, so far, the, okay, when the bottom fell out in 2008, within a year, many Marxists and socialists, not to mention the overwhelming number of mainstream economists, were speculating whether it would be a V or a U-shaped recession, that is, would last only a year, or would we be back on track to growth within two years? At the outside, three. Then a longtime friend, Charlie P., uh, also a member of Solidarity, like I am, gave a speech to the New York branch that the recession was just another average downturn in the business cycle, and the system would return to normal soon. When my brother and I read his paper, we openly and vigorously disagreed at a branch meeting in LA and said that his position was not only wrong, but was also completely, but also completely misunderstood where the capitalist system was at in the first decade of the 21st century. Then in early 2012, Charlie uh, once again wrote a piece and gave a talk titled Capitalist Crisis and the Rationality of Austerity. I responded some months later with why austerity is not rational, and it's in Solidarity's uh, discussion board. And uh, actually, it's a part one, because I have part two I haven't even finished yet. I never got an answer from Charlie, by the way, yet. He told me in 2012 summer school that he was going to answer, but I, it still hasn't come. Um, uh, some of you may have read my part one, because I did send it to you know, McKinney. Um, and I don't have time tonight to sketch out Carly's, Charlie's position, but I will lay out some of what I wrote in response to his piece, and we'll start with the eight, with eight shorthand reasons from my piece. Well, actually, I've got like 10 or 12. I added a couple of others. Uh, first is... The capitalist system's imperative to expand is objective, material, and is built into every production cycle of the capitalist system. It's just built in. It's there. Meaning that its cause, well, let's get the inability to realize surplus value, that's two, that is to sell the extra stuff at a profit is the most fundamental of reasons that led not only to the present crisis, but is at the core of most, if not all, economic recessions, depressions, and lesser downturns in the business cycle. 
The above innate contradiction is where it all begins. The collapse in demand from an overproduction of stuff is the primary cause. Three, surplus value, what workers produce and do not get paid for, is only potential profit. The extra stuff must be sold for more money than was initially invested for accumulation to take place. Four, overcapacity are too many machines competing with each other. A problem of quantity. This is, Sarah, uh, really, this four kind of is what you were talking about. Too many machines. The organic composition of capital is newer, upgraded machines with higher productivity. A problem of quality. Both situations press down on the return of in, on investment today. Both overcapacity and the high productivity of the machinery across the planet. So the squeezing profits, now they're still getting them, but they're shrinking in absolute numbers, believe it or not. It might not, doesn't appear that way, but if they are. The realization of surplus value in the aggregate, in the aggregate, the extra money, the profit, is achieved by expansion of the entire production process. Money is loaned into existence with interest by the banks. First and foremost, by increasing the number of workers involved in production, labor is the source of most exchange value in the capitalist system. But that's not what's happening since this big downturn. Yes? Exchange value, surplus value? Surplus value is the extra stuff. Exchange value is? is how much it's worth, you know, what you get, what you sell it for. That's the exchange value. It's, it, it's, it's different than a use value. And if there's no use value, you're gonna have a hard time selling it. So usually anything with exchange value also has use value. Down here, CMC is only about exchanging use values, even though you're using something to represent money. Usually in those days it was gold or silver or something else very special that embodied labor time, kind of unconscious labor time, why you're, there would be equivalence in your exchange. Got it? Okay, good. At least for now. Uh, six, the organic composition of capital significantly rose during the last 30 years. You right? didn't do five. Hmm? You didn't do five. Yes, the realization of surplus value in the aggregate oh, was fine. Six, the organic composition of capital significantly rose during the last 30 years, primarily because of computerization, particularly in the developing world, and is making increasing numbers of workers worldwide redundant, which I said before. And seven, the interest of individual capitalists and the interest of total capital are often in conflict. And this is another thing that confuses people. Um, including Marxist. And if you read you know, my little Tickman thing, he keeps bringing up all of these subjective things. And, all right, to assess the health of the system as a whole, total capital, that is industrial, merchants, uh, Charlie re refers to it as enterprise, and finance capital need to be included in their entirety to know how well things are going. Uh, eight, financialization centered on the proliferation of massive debt. And it partially stabilized the world capitalist system after the 1970s period of stagflation. But now the ability to pay off the debt is near impossible for increasing numbers of people and institutions including sovereign nations. Think Greece. And there's plenty of others. Nine, the sale of the extra stuff can only come from outside the capitalist worker paradigm. In the aggregate, again, you've got to go beyond those that are working in order to realize the profit in money by expanding the consumers, which means the workers, by hiring more and having more production to get more money loaned into existence with interest. 
and it, and it truly is like a Ponzi scheme. What only makes it, uh, it wouldn't be around if it didn't actually produce stuff, which it does. So it's why it's still limping along. Uh, all right, the sale of extra stuff can only come from outside the worker. Material need for expansion. Without expansion, the system seizes up as a result of overproduction. 10, the debt crisis is real and plays a significant role. And that is it's real within the, the rules of the capitalist system. A lot of people say, well, you know, you can, we could all get together and decide to do something and share something until we get it done. And that's kind of like debt, you know, I'll, I'll subsidize you and, and the like. And it doesn't have to be um, uh, at interest. It can be straight equal sharing. But that's not the rules of capitalism because you need the profit. You need that extra stuff for those at the top. Um, so the death crisis is real and plays a significant role in the unwillingness of rich folks and their agents to risk new capital investments. When demand continues to shrink, it is becoming clear to most investors that a significant part of the debt worldwide will never be repaid. Now this is where that slicing and dicing that the banks did, you know, because what it is, it's they've sold the Brooklyn Bridge to a hundred different people, a hundred percent of it to a hundred different people. So you have demands through all of these, everything you, you brought up, the collateral, these debt obligations, and the insurance on it, you know, it's, it's selling and reselling I mean, what they're packaging car loans now in, in, into and selling them off as uh, uh, around the world again. They're starting it again because and, and other things that are even more ludicrous. If you if I could mention them, I'm not time into that now. Uh, Eleven capitalism simply does not work without expansion. And now the inherent imbalance in the production process is bumping into the material limits to growth dictated by the finite nature of planet Earth. And that's one of the reasons why I love it if some people could go to the, the class this summer about why that is really, truly happening. Now I'm going to repeat myself again and say wages and benefits had been falling for 30 years before the system melted down. And I contend that the problem is rooted in the built-in material imbalance of the production cycle, the MCM1. And that enormous productivity of the means of production now functioning on a world scale far outpaces the need for employment of new workers. Combine the above with the impending crisis in the basic feedstock, energy, fossil fuels, of industrial production and the limits to growth will become clear to everyone as the system slows to a snail's pace. The incredibly high level of productivity of labor, primarily because of the sophisticated machines, has reached a point where the capitalist system no longer needs most of the increases in the world's human population, but is at the same time compelled to drive what's left of the planet's small farmers and peasants off the land. At least a billion people, now moving closer to two, are now redundant and are populating massive slums in increasing regions of the world. And for those that haven't read Mike Davis's Planet of Slums, you should. Hmm. So why is the capitalist class pushing austerity as a solution to the crisis of their system? First, austerity has always been a part of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism was a project to undo the, the New Deal to roll back Keynesianism, which is kind of the opposite of austerity. The capitalists have pretty much dismantled the Keynesian welfare state, which was designed to help the demand side of the system and not only helped mitigate the imbalance in the system, but I said helped to mitigate. It didn't end it in the system, but actually lessened the pain for those at the bottom. But it did not end the basic imbalance 
Today, a massive, a massive Keynesian project in the industrial world, world would ease the pain for most of, most of us, actually, and would extend the viability of the system in the near term, but would exacerbate climate change and soon bump into the limits to growth based on finite space and resources. Since austerity is directly opposite of Keynesianism, I conclude that most of the capitalist class and their lackeys do not understand how their system actually works. And since I've known over the years, since I had a business and blah, 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 and I've known a lot of them, they don't. Not a clue about how their system really works. Because austerity leads to stagnation and contraction. And these same people who are pushing their austerity say, we got to get the thing growing again. Europe is now entering another recession and is in the early stages of deflation. So what are the capitalist policies to turn this around and generate growth? Quantitative easing. The printing of money and giving it essentially free to the big banks to keep them, keep them from collapsing. Because the big banks across the world now are insolvent, except for maybe a couple of the emerging markets. Um, and hoping that some of it will trickle down and stimulate growth. And now, many of the big banks have instituted negative interest rates. People understand what that is? You pay them to keep your money in the bank. Now, Japan did that, kept trying that off and on. That was the first time in history. It doesn't really work. But now Europe is charging people to watch their money, put it in the bank. Is that? Yeah. Sorry. So I noticed there, like, there's, there are a lot of fees now, like just, and I, they're not calling They've it. already been having ne negative interest rates. Right, but it's called like, and fees, but now it's it's actually negative interest rates. Okay. It's announced. You got to pay us to put your money in our bank, and that's going on in Europe on many of the banks. I said Japan did it. Yeah, they've been doing it through trickery and fees and, and, and late charges and this and that and the other. And all of this is the reason is because the actual rate of profit. And I don't want to get into all that, but has been falling and absolute profits have been falling, and they have to keep producing more and more to make up the shrinking rate with volume. But you're bumping into, well, you still can't sell it. So, I mean, this is, it, the system is in real trouble across the planet. All right, and I'm trying to explain why, that it's not just that you got a bunch of greedy folks at the top, and because and, as long as, as, as everything operates under these rules, it has to keep doing what it's doing. All right. So now many of the banks have been some negative interest rates. You pay them to keep your money. The elites are now sitting on piles of money with no place to invest it. Then there's Greece. The capitalist system is no longer delivering the promised goods for the overwhelming majority of people. Any system that could not deliver for a long period of time historically has either collapsed or was overthrown. All of the policies pursued by the industrial countries are deepening the crisis. I only touch on a few. I hope you can dig deeper during the discussion because people will bring up the things that are going on here. Uh, before I conclude, I'm going to repeat something again. Um, it is true that individual capitalists tend to reject social democracy and the welfare state in their quest to maximize profits. But the system as a whole, and this is where you have to separate total capital from individual capitalists or CEOs or the managers, but the system as a whole tends to fare better when there is an increase of aggregate demand Put simply, ongoing aggregate profits come from an expansion of just about everything in the economy, particularly wages. 
One last comment before I finish. Marx famously said, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. In order for us, Marxists, socialists, anarchists, radicals in general, to actually help change the world, we have to move beyond simply interpreting events after they happen and begin anticipating events before they take place. Of course, there are always risks in projecting how the future will unfold. But given the, given the existential nature of humanity's predicament, it's way past time for us to boldly step up to the plate. Anyone can be a Monday morning quarterback. Now is the time to help lead the team to victory on Sunday. Oh, that's it.